Welcome to the Estates Made Simple podcast with Jenna Carvello and Gordon Vanderleek. We are on a mission to simplify the world of estate administration, helping executors gain the knowledge required to manage an estate. Please note, the following is for informational purposes only and is not to be considered legal, tax, or financial advice. We recommend you seek individualized advice for your unique situation with qualified professionals. Jenna, welcome again to another episode of Estates Made Simple. Today, we are going to talk about some common executor questions. So thanks for podcasting for another episode. And yeah, we appreciate the time we can spend to share some of our thoughts and record those for the benefit of our audience. Excellent. Nice to see you, Gord. It's always uh, nice to talk about all these topics because it is uh, beneficial for people to learn about these if they're acting as an executor. Yeah, so we've gathered some common questions that we've come across. And so if you're an executor, especially if you're doing it for the first time, maybe this is a helpful starting point just to know, get some answers to some of these typical questions. So uh, Jenna, what would you say would would be our first question that is a fairly a common one that you've heard people asking if they're in the hot seat here of being the executor and into this role. The number one question that I've been asked is how long does an estate administration take? When does my role end? So I always give people uh, an estimate that the average estate in Alberta takes around 18 to 24 months. And and I would say that's if it's a straightforward estate, maybe simple assets, maybe there's one real property and a few beneficiaries. But once you add on any additional layers of complexity, that timeline can be extended. So if there's complex assets, including assets in other jurisdictions, maybe there's privately held business interests or any assets that are otherwise difficult to sell, that estate administration period is going to be extended so that you can deal properly with those different assets. If there's complex family dynamics, that's another reason an estate administration can go longer. That could include claims against the estate, disagreements among beneficiaries or even disagreements between the executors uh, that's obviously going to extend that uh, estate administration period and then the last component i would say as a as a standard reason an estate may be extended is a complex tax situation uh, maybe the deceased hadn't filed taxes for a period of time up to their death maybe there are certain tax elections that the estate has to make um, that have certain time parameters around it uh, to save the estate money. And even I've, I've come across a few cases, uh, a few too many, I would say, is that um, some returns go to a, a special assessment area in CRA, which take even longer to be assessed um, and reviewed and then returned to the executor. So any of those components can extend the estate administration period. But it, I would say, you know, if you're an executor, expect at least 18 months and hope for the best. Yeah. And certainly if you're going through a, a grant of grant of probate, that's going to take a bit of time to get that in place before you even have the authority to be to start administering. And then there's a six month limitation period where people can make claims against the estate or you have to deal with the claims that do come forward. Right. So that can all add to the time frames. I think the other thought here would be making that assessment of how long it's going to take. So it's a great question to ask at the front end, because I think it's really important to set the parameters with the beneficiaries. Mm -hmm. uh, we always talk about good communication with the beneficiaries, and I think sizing up how long it's going to take, and you may need some professional advice to get some ideas about, okay, in this particular case, how long is it going to take? And that's part of your communication strategy with the beneficiaries, because I think a lot of people go once they find out they're in the will and or they go, I'm expecting this much for a mom and mom or dad's estate. They may start spending the money or beginning to think about they would like to spend the money. So you have to put the brakes on and say, this is a long process, right? Even just getting a final clearance certificate in the simple estate, it could take three to four months. And if, as you say, if there's a complex assets or complex tax filings that have to be reviewed, it could be a significantly longer amount of time and you're at the hands, you're in the hands of Canada Revenue Agency and that could take quite some time. So yeah, I think th that's a great question. Sometimes hard to always answer, but the message would be, we I, I often summarize it to say, we measure in months, not days and weeks, that this is a long process and just communicating that effectively to, to beneficiaries, I think is important. Another question that I come, that comes up a lot, and I've, even when we've done seminars on this topic is, 
okay, I'm the executor, break it down for me. What are the steps involved in administering administering an estate? So there, there are, broadly speaking, several phases you go through on a typical estate administration. And in that situation, I, I think you and I are, can be agreed there's effectively three larger categories you could say an estate is going to go through. There's a period of investigation. You got to find the original will. Just had a conversation yesterday with a client and they were talking about where they're going to store their will. And I said, yeah, don't keep that a secret from the executor. Mm -hmm. Executor needs to know where it is. And sometimes just if that conversation didn't happen, it takes a long time just to even find the will. Uh, if you can't find it, you need to show that you've done due diligence to look. Well, that's not a two-day exercise, right? It's going to take a long time to, to say you've done your due diligence. So that's going to add to the time. You've got to find the assets and liabilities. You have to list all of those on the application form as best you know. So just ascertaining what's out there and taking stock of what's there. You need addresses and names and email addresses, phone numbers for all the beneficiaries. We talk about communicating, but you got to know where they are. Sometimes just finding them um, can be a chore, right? If yes. somebody's not readily available, like where does this person live? This that was mentioned in the will and figure all that out. You've got to get authority through CRA to be able to look at the tax filings in the past, right? Uh, get the account, the authorization to go into the CRA website and say, how do things look in terms of prior tax filings? Was there arrears? Was there not? Is there amounts owing? Is there not? Figuring all that out. So there's that investigation stage at the front end, which which in my experience, that first investigation stage can consume a significant amount of time, right? We talked in the prior episode about time management. Um, I think just assessing and knowing that at the front end, there's a lot of heavy lifting to figure all this stuff out and just dedicating that time at the front end would be important because some of these some of these matters may take a while. This, I think once you gather all the information, then I think you move into the collecting and managing that asset collection phase of the administration. And that's where you would get the authority, go, uh, file your grant to probate, could certainly put the pitch in to, to say probate historically has been seen as a very slow and cumbersome and difficult process, and it's much streamlined in Alberta. So hopefully that doesn't take as long. Sometimes you can get grants of probate turnaround in a short period of time. But you ultimately then have to collect the assets and put them into the estate account. Are you going to sell it? Are you not going to sell it? Dealing with all that, you got to figure out what are the liabilities? Is there sufficient fund? Gather the funds, the, have the liquidity to be able to make the payment of the debts or maybe negotiate with the creditors if required, and then retain the account to file the final, to file the taxes. At the time of this recording, we're right in the middle of tax time. And the, the, the if the person passed away before filing their tax return by April 30th for the prior year, you've got to attend to that, right? Mm -hmm. And so then there's a bunch of work involved in gathering that and getting those things filed. And that it that's probably it can be a longer stretch in that that middle section to to do all that work once you've figured out what's there and gathered all the information. And then ultimately, we have our eye to the prize, which is a final distribution, right? So we're once we've substantially completed the administration of the estate, you could consider an interim distribution. When everything is finalized, including the final clearance certificate, then you would consider a final distribution. But that's where you got to put a financial report together for the beneficiaries, get their approval of that, and their release to say they're happy with what you've done and your proposed distribution in the estate. So given that the estate's going to take, as as we said earlier, could 18 months is not out of line, right? Some estates get done a little bit quicker, some a little bit longer. It's a good thing to think it could be uh, over a year. Ideally, you get most of it done, or you might even consider an interim distribution within the executor's year, but to finalize it often takes longer than that, right, to, for that final clearance certificate. So considering and getting advice on, is it appropriate to do an interim distribution along the way would be uh, definitely something to consider. So I think you gather the information, you complete your administration, do all the filings you need. Once you get approved by the court as the um, executor, or if there isn't a will, the administrator of the estate, and then proceed as quickly as you can to doing a, a distribution in as reasonably quick a time as possible. Again, it's it's measured in months and, and sometimes years, but and, and not in days and weeks. 
but you, your job is to move it forward as reasonably practical as possible. And I think you'll find for our executors listening, there's lots of checklists online to help you through the necessary stages, but I will say it's not an exhaustive list. Each estate is unique, so there may be something that you need to deal with in the estate that's not necessarily on checklists that you will find. So it's always good to get some experts to review it to identify any missing items that you may not think of or, or know about. Uh, another common question that we get too is, what's my risk? What's the issue with being an executor? It's important for executors to know that they can be held personally liable for any mistakes that they make in the course of the estate administration. The court is generally not forgiving on well-being or well-intended executors, even if they're trying their hardest and just accidentally make a mistake that costs the estate some money. Executors are supposed to hire experts if they don't know what they're doing. So it's important to know that if you do make a mistake, you could be held personally liable. And some of those common areas that we find that executors make a mistake could be mismanagement of the estate assets. Perhaps it's not invested properly or an asset isn't sold quickly enough that depreciates the value of the estate. Misfiled tax returns is another thing, even late tax returns, missed elections. There are certain things that need to be done within a certain time period in order to take advantage of certain elections. And so that needs to be done or else the estate could lose out on valuable dollars. And then another area that executors can get caught up on is having inadequate insurance for the estate assets real property insurance. Maybe there's a valuable piece of art that's not insured properly. Maybe there's a vacant piece of land, which I actually come across quite often without liability insurance on it, because who knows who's going to be crossing that, that vacant piece of land and step in a hole and break their leg. You just never know what could happen. And so you just want to ensure that your base is protected and you're not going to be paying the estate for damages that may occur during the course of the administration. Yeah, and even considering executor's insurance, right? That is something that, that in addition to the insurance for loss of the property or liability associated with this, yeah, if somebody hurts themselves on land owned by the deceased, the estate's going to get sued, right, mm -hmm. on, on that if there's a personal injury claim on that. So just investigating those insurance options, I think, become important. And that, again, part of that investigative stage, right, I, I would reinforce that point to say, those are some of the things you have to do right at the beginning. What if the person was missing their insurance payments towards the end of their life for medical reasons or, or maybe loss of capacity going in and saying, let's make sure we get that and catch up those premiums or making sure that insurance still is in place or getting coverage or it, it ended up getting lapsed, right? You've got a vehicle in the garage. Is the car insurance paid? What, like making those investigations would be really important not to ask the question, could lead to some risks for sure. So those are some good points. And again, some of this involves, if you're not sure, get the advice, right? right. That's where you cover yourself because you wouldn't be negligent if you sought out the advice and relied on that advice to say, what should I do in this case? If you're not sure, just be curious in answering the question, what's the risk? And go to those people who can assess the risk and then rely on that advice in terms of mitigating the risk on that as well. No, excellent comments on that. And hopefully some of those common questions will that get you thinking if you're in the role and if we've triggered something that you go, oh shoot, I didn't do that. Then tomorrow's a good day to start to try to fix some of the things if you are in that role and now through this education feel that, oh, maybe I should have done that. It's best not to ignore it and hope nobody finds out. It'd be better to say, let me fix it up, right? And do that sooner, do that immediately versus sitting on it would take action on that to mitigate the the risk. So hopefully if those are helpful, I, I, I think for me, a helpful review, a good statement of the important questions to ask that we commonly see. So hopefully that triggers, that's our beneficial to our audience. So thank you, Jenna, for the, the, the conversation. We'll wrap it up there. As always, uh, reach out to us if there's a question and you uh, are not sure about the answer. We're here to help answer those questions. So we appreciate you listening. We, to help to reach more people, if you could subscribe, we would love that because uh, that increases our reach and, and our, our passion is to reach as many people as possible. So do share it. And But if you subscribe, that way you don't miss any uh, new episodes that come out. 
and and we very much appreciate that uh, that effort to help us reach more people on that. So you can certainly your podcast app of choice, you can subscribe, but also we uh, post these videos on our YouTube channel if you prefer to to consume the content that way. And we appreciate your support in either or both of those categories. So until next time, Jenna, stay safe. And, and we look forward to the next time we get to podcast and chat about making estate simple. Thanks, Gord.